So I know I have a number of you in my 930 professional sales class. You have my, okay, so I tell you, I, I'm going to give you my disclaimer. I only have so many stories. Since there is overlap in the content of the two courses, you'll get a little bit of the same. I will try for your benefit as a service provider to engage in value co-creation, and I will try to be funnier and tell different stories for this part of the lecture today for the benefit of you so that you don't hear the same thing over and over and over again with regard to ethics. Is that okay? You know, but if, if you just feel like it's just too much and you can't take it, I, I understand if you have to get up and go out and like stretch your legs, let your head explode or whatever you want to do. It's a relatively free country in spite of, you know, the Patriot Act and others that have um, Which, by the way, as I say that, I, I should remind you, Tonight is what? The State of the Union. This is the President's address to the nation, and it is ultimately a marketing speech. He is going to be selling his policies and programs and why he should be you know, allowed to continue in power and why you should vote for the Republicans in the 2018 midterm elections. Uh, this is the start of that, so you should watch it. It is, it is fundamentally a marketing speech. Historically, this President didn't initially, he just sent a State of the Union. He didn't actually go and read it uh, into the congressional record in the early years of our nation, but when television came about, it became a marketing event, it's something that they could use to sway public opinion. And so it is fundamentally a marketing speech, and he's going to try and tell you why he's done all these great things, why the economy is growing, and you should get credit for it, and that's uh, an important thing to watch. So watch it tonight from a marketing perspective. It's also important that you watch these things because it impacts when we talked about, and Dr. Morelli talked about environmental scanning, didn't he, on, on Thursday. When we think about environmental scanning, the regulatory environment that we face as business people is important. And so the President's speech will talk about those things, he'll touch on those things, as he's attempted to reduce business regulations. So we're continuing on today, and I noticed that a number of the groups have submitted their paper if after today's discussion you decide that you want, and we may not finish all of this today, that you want to resubmit that paper uh, because you think you've got some more that you want to add to it, I will let you do that. It will be open until midnight tonight. The Dropbox will be available until midnight tonight for those of you who want to revise. Again, because you will probably want to get bonus points, I encourage you to think about that because the average test scores in this class tend to be about 65. The reason that they tend to be about 65 on the first couple of exams, at least uh, the first one or two, is that the exams in here, because there are a hundred of you, they are multiple choice, and I, I can't you know, grade a whole lot of essays. I have uh, one essay that's an individual essay that's the article reviews that you all will be doing. And after this, we will talk about how to make a logical and critical thinking argument for those logic or for those for those article reviews and also how to write your paper for the group project. But I can't grade a, a whole lot of essays. So we have to make the exam such that it tests more than just superficial knowledge. And the way we do that is by first of all we have some embedded questions that the department insists that I use in each exam to test for assessment. And the other way that we do it is by ensuring that it's not just being able to identify terms but being able to apply those terms to concrete examples. And those can be very subtly different among the, the choices. And so you'll want to maybe get the bonus points by doing really well on the critical thinking challenges in here. That's, you know, you're welcome to not take my advice. Students who take my advice generally do well. Um, students who don't take my advice generally don't do well. I had a girl several semesters ago, as I was saying things like this is a test question, you should write it down. She audibly sighed, rolled her eyes around in her little head, slammed her pencil down on the desk, folded her arms, and looked at me. And my only response was, you know, it is unimportant whether or not you like me when it comes to your grade. What's more important is that I like you, and I didn't like her. So, you know, I just when I say these things, like, for your benefit, I'm not just saying it to be mean or to, you know, hear myself talk, I, I actually do care about students and care about engaging in value co-creation, so I point these things out to you. The critical thinking challenge will give you an opportunity to really make up some of the difference. That's another data point that I have when I'm, when I'm doing final grades. So 
this was the perfect thinking challenge that we talked about. That's due tonight by midnight. This part of the course involves the study of philosophy. And so students oftentimes ask me, what does philosophy have to do with marketing? Why should I care about this? You know, isn't that something that they teach in the, in the college across the parking lot that you refer to lovingly as hippy-dippy, right? That's what I call it. If you go over there, it's just amazing. I've seen professors over there wearing cut-off shorts and teaching, right? And flip-flops. Like, where, where are we? People you know, like, this is not appropriate. And they've got you know, long hair, and Jamie Mock, who's a humanities and philosophy professor over there, has you know, tattoos all over his body, and I, I, I'm just you know, sort of, I don't know. Um, but I think that philosophy is important uh, in business. Because I'm a theory guy, so I naturally can tell you that that's my prejudice that I tend to, to think of it. What is the highest degree? So when you get a degree, the highest degree, the doctor's degree in marketing, you don't get a degree it doesn't say doctor of marketing, like the MD. You get a PhD, and the, that stands for doctor of philosophy. And why is it that we get the PhD as the highest degree that's awarded on a college campus? Because fundamentally, what we are seeking is the truth. And that is a deeply philosophical question, and it applies to marketing. There are what I call perennial questions that have applied to all people at all places in all societies at all times that are fundamental to the way we approach our acquisition of knowledge. Now, you can answer these questions without using philosophy. But the answers that you get may not be satisfactory in terms of really developing uh, and, and advancing as a society if you don't use philosophy. So the three great questions that philosophy attempts to answer and that are important to marketing are the question of knowledge. What is it I can know, and how can I know it? What is it I can know, and how can I know it? We think we know a lot of things, <coughs> and maybe we don't really know. So for the benefit of my students that had to hear me talk about this part of the lecture, before I used a different example, I will attempt to come up with something else as my example for today. What is this device that I am using right here? It's a smartphone. Somebody said an iPhone. Which is it? How do I know? Some of you said it's a smartphone. What makes it a smartphone? Is the phone truly smart? Or is that an oxymoron? It's a brand. A smartphone is a brand? Okay. As opposed to a dumb phone? Hey, who has a flip phone in here? Is that a dumb phone? Kinda. Why do you have a flip phone? What? You're pretty low tech. You're sitting there with a the computer. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet you're not you're not taking notes. And you're probably surfing the web, aren't you? Watching the internet, listening to something else besides the yammering, the gentle yammering of my voice. So what is this? Is it a phone? Computer phone? That's what I call a smart phone. It sounds better than a computer phone. Nobody's going to buy a computer phone. It sounds better than a computer phone. It's more appealing. When I was growing up, not that many years ago, That's what phones look like. You didn't own them, you rented them from the phone company. They charged you to buy them, they were pretty expensive. You actually had to dial this thing. So how do I know that this is a phone, 
that's, they look nothing alike, do they? How many of you actually talk to people on your phone? You're lying. <laughs> we know that your generation, my generation grew up, it was a big deal for my generation to have, for kids to have their own phone line. My, my brother and I had our own phone line. We had a kid's phone line. And that was a big deal because the parents didn't want you talking on the phone. My generation liked to talk on the phone. My parents' generation liked to talk face to face because that's what they grew up with. They grew up socializing face to face. My generation, it's more impersonal to talk on the phone and we like that. You can't read people, and so you don't feel rejection if you're talking on the phone the way you do if you're talking face to face. As I, when I called you all liars just a minute ago, there are three of you that were giving me this look right there in the middle row, like, uh, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> You don't know me. <laughs> but we know that you don't really talk on the phone. You may, you may talk some on the phone, but you prefer to do what? FaceTime. No. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, studies show that you prefer to text. Why is that? It's even less personal. You're less likely to have a fear of rejection. We don't expect an instant response to a text, although we love it when we get them and people are having phantom texts. So I don't actually like to talk on the phone anymore. I would much rather text. I don't like email. I would much rather you text me than send me an email. And again, keep it short, 140 characters. I don't need your life story. Same with our emojis. Count the emojis as, as, as a, you know, one. <laughs> 140 characters. I, I don't think, I mean, I've had students tell me the most awful things. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be there. I've thrown up 24 times. No, I don't need, I, I'm sick. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to be there. I'll, I'll excuse the absence. So is this actually, I mean, is this a phone? I use my phone far more to control that device over there than I do as a phone. I hate talking on the phone anymore. Send me a text. You know, if I want to talk to you, I'll talk to you face to face. So how do I know that this is a phone? It looks nothing like that, does it? Let's look at Okay. 
characteristics like the old mode, they both have the main function to call. But I don't use this primarily for calling anymore. I use it like I don't even call my family anymore. I went to Florida, you know, and it used to be that like in the olden days, like five years ago, when we would go to Florida or something like that, and I would lose my family, I'd start calling them on their cell phones, like, where are you? We go, we go to Disney World almost every year because we've got family that lives in southern Florida, and it's a nice place to go over the holiday break to visit them and go to Disney World. My nieces and nephews love Disney World. They're just huge Disney fans, and it's great to go there. And so, you know, like 10 years ago, when we started this little tradition, I'd call, you know, like, where are you in the park? I don't even do that now. What do I do? I track. I track them. I just hit track iPhones and up pops a list of my family. And I can see exactly where they are. It's great. I don't have to call them anymore. Yes? Uh, can it be that the reason why it's called a smartphone because it's not only you can call, but you can access other apps and other devices around your house, such as like a smart TV back in the day, the regular TV. You guys have to use the antennas to make sure you can figure out what cable channel you have. Yeah, that's right. Well, we didn't have cable channels. The antennas didn't get cable. That was broadcast. Yeah, like, so now they have like smart TVs where you can access a lot of different like apps, such as Amazon, Google, Netflix, which considers the term smart home smart TV. You don't only watch it like cable. You can actually watch like other things, such as you can operate your phone with like what's it called Alexa or Google. That's probably the reason why it's considered a smartphone. Just when you talk text, you can also. I'm not sure it's really a phone much anymore. I think it's more of a useful handheld device. Turkey bacon. Uh, like, it ain't bacon. If you called it a nondescript breakfast dish, I, okay, not making. Yeah. I think the reason that it's called a phone is because it's evolved from what used to be the phone. So it just slowly changed over time, but yet it was still, the changes were so small each time that it was still a phone. But now we've gotten to where it's something completely different, but it's still called a phone because that's what it was originally like. Okay. All right. What about a phone? So, like, it's like kind of like comparing like a Swiss Army knife to a knife. Like, the main purpose of a Swiss Army knife. Still call this Swiss Army knife because that's its primary function. What it was originally called. How the phone was originally called. Alright, so things are named for their function. Is that right? For the most part. Okay. What's the primary function? So the function of this right now is. To be a table. I don't know, it's a chair. <laughs> <laughs> It's still a table. It's still holding things. That chair can hold things like papers and journals. It's still a chair. But it's still a chair. You see, here's the point. We can't even agree on simple things like a table. I don't think that's a table. I think it's a desk. Um, <laughs> how are we going to agree on something that's even more difficult? Like ethics. We can't, you know, as somebody said in here, what, if, what I showed you this picture, somebody said horse. It looks a lot more like a horse than it does like that, that little fluffy shizu. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, it's what? This is not trivial. How can I know? What can I know and how can I know it? This is divided into two fields. Epistemology, which is the study, the systematic study of knowledge. How can I acquire knowledge? How can I know the things that I know? And is it all an artificial construct? The other part of this is metaphysics, which is the study of reality. 
how do I know that this is not all some grand illusion? For the Buddhist, I'm you, you are me, we're the wall, and this is all an illusion. You're shaking your head now. <laughs> are, are you going to debate Eastern philosophy with me now, too? It's the understanding that none of this matters. What is reality? How can we know it? How do we know that we're not just living in a dream? That we're not all part of some figment of an imagination? How many of you have had dreams that seemed so real? How do you know that we're not just that? We're not somebody's enormously complex dream. We're not simply a dream in the eye or mind of the Godhead. How do we know that? How did Descartes think he knew that? What's his most famous word? Think, therefore I am. Right? So how do we know what we think we know? The second great question is the question of conduct, moral philosophy. What is it that is the right conduct? How should we engage? How should we behave towards one another? And again, this is not trivial. In marketing particularly, what should we be able to sell? What should be legal? In this nation, it is perfectly legal to market on television the pharmaceutical drugs that you all run to your doctor and insist you have to have. That's not the case in other countries. Should we be able to, we're engaging in this debate, one of the things that's going to be interesting from a marketing standpoint is to watch an industry in its infancy, a really incredible example of an enormously powerful product in its infancy and take rise and take hold, and that is the marijuana industry. Should that be legal to sell? We're having that debate now. Is that, is that moral? Is it just? Should Colorado be able to do that? The state of Oklahoma sued Colorado under the theory that they were violating our sovereignty by selling this stuff in Colorado and affecting people in Oklahoma. Should we be able to, should you be able to do that? Jefferson Beauregard Sessions has decided that you shouldn't. Under the Obama administration's rule, they said, eh, we're not, you know, it's against the federal law, but we're not really going to enforce it if you're not what we call a kingpin. Well, then we have to decide what's a kingpin. I think we all think we know what a kingpin is. It's Pablo Escobar. And the Medellin drug cartel. As opposed to somebody who wears a suit and tie in Colorado and grows pot in the greenhouse. Should we, should we do that? Again, these are, these are debates that we have to have. And then the question of governance. What is the correct form of government? Government. This is obviously important to marketing because as Dr. Burley, he talked about environmental scanning, he should have talked about the regulatory environment. What can you sell? How can you go about doing this? You can't market to children in most of Western Europe. You can't have these happy ads with kids eating this high fat food and getting a toy. You can't do that. Is that correct? Or is that impede upon the freedom of the marketplace. So these are, these are three questions that are critically important. They've affected everybody from the great philosophers. And it turns out, so students oftentimes ask me, what could Socrates or Plato or Aristotle have to say about these things? It turns out quite a lot. They answered these three questions. Socrates in Republic answers. That is the first fully worked out philosophical system that answers these questions. What is the right form of conduct? What is it that we can know? And what is the right form of governance? Aristotle takes a different approach. He takes a scientific approach to this. And there is not one discipline that we teach on a college campus that has not been impacted by Aristotle and Aristotelian philosophy. The way we classify things in biology was largely put together by 
Aristotle into kingdom phylogenus and species, he came up with the basis of that sort of classification of things. He was out there studying the cuttlefish. He was giving advice to Alexander the Great. So these are important questions that we have to think about. And they impact on marketing, obviously. As an activity, Philosophy lets us think deeply about these things, and so I'm going to ask you to think deeply about these things. And so in order to do that, we have to deal with what we call the philosophical challenges to any code of ethics. Any attempt to come up with ethics has often been challenged by these three theories or philosophies. Two of them sound right, but are more easily dispensed with the third doesn't sound right, but is actually the hardest to deal with. So the first challenge to philosophical ethics, this idea that we can know anything, is called subjectivism. Subjectivism relies upon a philosophical concept called solipsism. Solipsism is this idea, and I gave you the Steve Martin version of this, where it illustrates that he could never imagine being a female. He could never imagine being anyone other than who he really was. We can't really know what it is to be somebody else, to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. And so since the self is all we can truly know, subjectivists say <coughs> ethics, is up to the individual. Now this sounds intuitively appealing because if we ask difficult questions like, should we legalize marijuana? I bet we would have a wide range of answers in here. Although your generation seems to be more tolerant than even my generation of this idea. I, I'm a Gen Xer, but I still grew up in an age where we believe that drugs are bad. Just say no. Nancy Reagan. Not on, you know, television. Just say no. That was her horribly vapid campaign to try and keep kids off drugs. As if it was that simple. Just say no. So should we legalize marijuana? Should we sell it? Well, yeah, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Okay. <laughs> So is sex trafficking. Should we legalize that? No. no. Why should we legalize pot? Because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Because the person who sells it on the whole thing. We can sell it, not legal. What? The, the precedent was set from alcohol and tobacco. They both those both have proven to harm you and proven to be a not a not for your system. Whereas marijuana, while it's still obviously has some negative effects, not nearly as bad as tobacco alcohol. Actually, they've done a study recently, Harvard published it, I believe, in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they, they looked at non-smokers, smokers, and people who were heavy pot smokers. And they thought that, you know, obviously the smokers would have higher incidences of lung cancer than the non-smokers, and that they thought pot smokers would also have higher incidences. People who were heavy pot smokers would also have higher incidences of lung cancer than uh, non-smokers. And it turns out, according to at least one study, that the pot smokers had fewer incidences of cancer. Of course, I believe that. It helps slow cancer. Yeah. Or at least some of the chemicals do. What was there was a hand up over here. Uh, I was going to say, why not, just on the basis of, like you said, there wasn't, there's no like, real bad attitude. And plus, if you can go do stuff recreationally, like, people who are going to do that are going to do it anyways. So, I mean, just because someone else is now selling it and making a profit off it, it changes the fact that it's just money's being changed into a different hand. Okay. We tried this with Prohibition, it didn't work, yes. I was going to say, I mean, like you said, it's around, so like if someone wants it, they're going to get it anyway. So the government's really just missing out on that tax like yeah. benefit that could be used to fund our education or used to fund, you know, many of the other problems that we have because it's already around. Like it's not like it's just part of it. Right, and in fact, we spend a lot more money trying to criminalize and chasing people. We spend a lot more money. It's estimated, and these estimates are, of course, skewed maybe 
by people who want to make the argument because you can use, there's, there's uh, among lawyers we say there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Because you can use statistics in many ways to manipulate. Now I think that's a misunderstanding of, of the use of statistics. But a lot of statisticians have come up with the idea that about 90% of the population that are in prison are in prison because of drug-related charges. Now you say, how is that when we have a lot of people that are in prison for things like murder in Oklahoma? Well, why are they in prison for murder? Well, they were on drugs when they killed somebody. You know, a lot of them were on drugs. They were trying to get drugs when they killed somebody because it went bad and they got shot, or they shot somebody. Or they were trying to get the money to go get drugs, and they shot somebody. So a lot of these crimes, now it depends on, again, how you massage the statistic. A lot of people are, if we took those people out of prison and put them in treatment, we might be better off. It costs less than putting them in prison. Prison's actually a very expensive form of rehab, and it's not terribly effective. Yeah? What if that only happened? That only happened because it's illegal, though. Like, if it was still so legal, you wouldn't have those murders. Right, exactly, and that's that's the point that the people who want to legalize this stuff say is, look, if we legalized this and we made it cheap and we took it off the black market, you would have a decrease in the in the prison population. You would have an increase in revenues. Right now, what we have is we have a horrible problem in our state with revenue. Don't we? You have this revenue source, a sin tax, and you're decreasing a, a, a huge cost. One of the biggest costs. Why is it that when I went to school here in Oklahoma in college, 80% of the tuition was paid by the state, and I paid 20%? That is now flipped. You pay about 80 to 90% of the cost to educate you, and the state picks up. We're no longer really a state institution. And we could turn that money back around. If we, why is it that we have horrible funding for, well, if you have to cut costs, who can you cut costs? You can't cut prisons. Because the federal government steps in and says you can't stack people up. You can't just put them all in there. We would like to, but it violates constitutional principles. The Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. So if we got rid of a lot of those people in prison, we're saving money and we're making money on the revenue side, aren't we? So that, now, the problem with that argument is that a lot of people would say, look, just because something makes money doesn't mean you should do it. There, should, there are things that we say you should not do. A lot of what we criminalize, we define who we are as a society by what we criminalize. Until 2003, in a case called Lawrence and Gardner versus Texas, homosexual sodomy was illegal in places like Oklahoma. Could you really catch people and arrest them for it? No. But we criminalized it because we said that's bad. And so maybe we want to say as a society, we don't like drugs. I don't know. So this is, a, this is an important debate. So subjectivists would say, look, we can't agree on these things. And everybody has a different opinion in here. Some of you, I would be willing to bet, would say, yeah, let's legalize pot, but not the cocaina. Right? Let's legalize pot, but not the wacky tobacco, or the wack oil, which is PCP and jet fuel that they put on a cigarette. Right? Not crack, not math, you know, not all these other things. Those are all like proven to be addictive to them. What? Those are all like proven to be addictive to them. Yeah? Natural. Tobacco. And natural. Tobacco, well, you know, then we get into a debate of what's natural. <laughs> You know, is the tobacco, is the pot that they're growing in Colorado the natural? No, it's not. I mean, if you, if it's, this is not the stuff that was growing out by the highway in 1963. It's still natural, it's still genetically evolved. I mean, you're not like right? Cocaine yeah. comes from the coca plant. It's yeah. natural. Yeah. Um, they have to go through a chemical process again. 
you have to go to like hydrochloric acid and oxide. Hydrochloric acid's natural, it's a natural product. It's not a synthetic chemical that we came up with, is it? You can see the difficulty. Is there anything that we can know? This debate highlights the idea. Is there anything that we can know a priori? Is there anything we can know about ethics without reference to experience? That we can know with the mind's eye as opposed to a posteriori, which is knowledge that's gained through experience. A priori knowledge, how did Pythagoras know that if you had a rectilinear triangle, right angle triangle, one side is three, one side is four, the other side is five? Well, he knew this with the mind's eye. He didn't go around in ancient Greece drawing triangles in the dirt. And it works out well if it's three, four, five. It doesn't work out so well if you have other numbers. But he could see this with the mind's eye. And it's true, right? A rectilinear triangle is going to be true on the moon, and it's true on the planet Earth as well. It's true in space. It's true in all places at all. Is there anything like this in ethics that we can know? Well, subjectivists would say no. They would say there are no universal truths like the Pythagorean theorem in ethics. Well, is there anything that we can know without experiencing it? Well, I would say that there are things that we can know without experiencing it. You probably don't want, I have a concealed carry permit. I am morally offended by students who fall asleep in my class. Therefore, I take out my 357 Magnum and smite you. Why are you carrying something that big? You know? Justice is fast. You probably don't have to experience death to know that you don't want to die, do you? So we can at least agree on that. People fundamentally want to live. And they will live. I mean, people cling to life in even the most dire of circumstances. They, they want to go on. Very few people give up living. Very few people commit suicide. So you don't have to experience death to know that you probably don't want it. I think that we can come up with a lot of others. A lot of students will say, well, you follow the golden rule. The problem with the golden rule is that I may want things done to me that you don't want done to you. It works a lot of the time. It's a pretty good rule of thumb, but it doesn't work all the time because there may be things that I want done to me that you don't want done to you. If you turn it around and you make it and you state it in the negative, it works almost 99% of the time. In the first century CE, the great rabbinic scholar Hillel was approached by a pagan who said that he would convert to Judaism if Hillel could teach him the entire Torah while standing on one leg. Hillel replied, that which is hateful to yourself, do not unto your fellow man. That is the whole of the Bible. The rest is but commentary, go and learn. This is an enormous piece of exegesis. This statement didn't mention anything about the you know, 5,000 commandments that are in the Bible, in the Old Testament. That which is hateful to yourself, do not unto your fellow man, that is the whole. I think that there are things that we can, even though we can't disagree, and what I would say to people who say you can't agree on things like marijuana, those are really hard questions. There are really hard questions in physics. There are really hard questions in math where people don't agree, in pure logic on the solution. And so if we think about the really hard questions, no, we may not find agreement, but if we start with something more basic, and we have the right kind of framework in mind, we can't actually agree. Now, another one that comes about is more difficult to dispense with. It's called cultural relativism. Cultural relativism says, look, the problem with subjectivism is if I accepted subjectivism as true, we could never be sitting here today 
Because I would not trust you, you would not trust me. This would be what Hobbes calls in Leviathan, the war of all against all. I used to think this would be great. As a little kid, I used to think, I don't need law. Anarchy, that's fantastic. How many of you like the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet? Oh, come on. More of you like me. Come on, you like the Animal Planets, don't you? That's cute. I love, I, I don't have children. I have animals. I love them. They are my children. I have a pet squirrel. We've trained her. She knows 35 distinct words, which is more than some of you will know on test day. <laughs> I particularly like the animal shows on Sub-Saharan Africa. I've always wanted to go to Sub-Saharan Africa. Lions are the only feline species that naturally live in groups. Most, you wonder why your cat doesn't like the other cat. You get a, you know, you think, oh, Puddin needs a friend. I'll get a friend for Puddin. And they just can't stand each other. So that's because cats are sort of solitary creatures. They're pretty happy being alone. It's typified by the fact that, you know, if you die and your dog is in the house, the dog will sit there and guard your body. If you die and a cat's in the house, the cat will eat you. You are just staff to the cat. That's all you are. But lions are the exception. They live in prides. And it's good to be the male lion in a pride. The lionesses do all of the work. He comes along, he takes what he wants, and then he goes back to sleep. Great lion. The problem is that at some point, that lion become old and feeble. And when he does, another male will come in and will take over his pride. And he will kill all of the cubs from that other line. This is the state of nature that Hobbes imagines. And he says, we come out of this and we form societies and we give up some of our individual rights in order to, to thrive and flourish. And so ethics are not subjectively based in the individual, but rather they're based in the group. It's our group mores that determine what's right or wrong. And this is intuitive. It sounds reasonable. Women, for the first time, it's now 2018, and for the first time they're allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. We're well into the second decade of the 21st century, and they're just now getting to drive in Saudi Arabia. Cultural relativists would say, well, that's, that's just their culture. You should accept it. Huh? So I think Saudi Arabia is going to have the biggest probably have flying taxis. Should we accept that? The problem with cultural relativism is if you, if you make an argument ad absurdum, we could never have said and we could never have gone to war in World War II against Nazi Germany. We could never, they, don't, oh, they just don't like Jews. That's their culture. We have to accept it. I think that there's a problem with that. The third challenge to ethics doesn't seem correct, but it's actually the one that's the most difficult to dispense with. The problem with cultural relativism is that if we accept it, we, we, there are lots of things that a lot of us are just going to say, mm, you can't do that. You can't, you can't eliminate an entire race of people. That's a priori wrong. And we can find prohibitions. A cultural relativists would say there are no universal truths that we can find in all cultures in all places at all times. But that's just not true. There are. There are at least three that we can find in all places at all times. There is a prohibition against killing members of the in-group. In all societies, no society could allow for the indiscriminate killing of members of the in-group. You can't kill members of the in-group. 
Now there are exceptions to every rule, right? So what are some exceptions to the rule about killing the, the indiscriminate killing of members of the in group? We define murder as the, in the common law as the unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought. So what's not murder? Well, defense of oneself is not murder, right? It's justified killing. You can't have the indiscriminate killing. No society could sustain itself if it allowed for the indiscriminate, I just don't like you, so bam, you're gone. Couldn't, couldn't sustain yourself. All societies have a prohibition against bearing false witness. Against members of the in-group. Now, you might be able to do these things to the members of the out-group, societies outside of ours. As we become more advanced, more sophisticated, we, do, we, we don't say that you could, for example, kill the Canadians when they come running across the border. Historically, you could do that. Those are members of the out-group. You could kill them if they came running. No, we can't do that now. We've, we've extended that prohibition to even members of the out-group. But all societies, even primitive ones, will say you can't kill members of the in-group. You can't bear false witness against members of the in-group. You can't say, that guy stole from me. If he's a member of the in-group. Now you may be able to do it to members of the out-group. And you can't steal from members of the, of the in-group. Now there are societies from in-group. There are societies that live more communally than ours. And so they share things. So you have to think about stealing as being, you know, you don't take somebody's personal possessions, their beads, their clothing, things like that from them, even though they are more communalistic than we are. So I think we can say that there are things that we're willing to say we can't do, even from a cultural standpoint, although Hobbes says that maybe that's, that's where it ends. And I think Hobbes is wrong. I think we have a duty and an obligation to say you don't do these things. You don't engage in genocide. You don't engage in slavery or slave trade. Which, by the way, there is still modern day slavery. We're coming up on the largest chocolate buying day in America. What is it? Valentine's Day. And a lot of chocolate is actually produced by slave labor on the west coast of Africa. And I think we can say it, it's incredible to believe, but there are a lot of people that are still enslaved in things like uh, the cocoa production on the west coast of Africa. And there are ways that you can tell. Does anybody know how you can tell whether or not your chocolate that you're eating is ethically sourced? How? Okay, how do you research it? What are the what are the telltale signs that it's that it's ethically sourced? Well, for one, it says that it's Okay, so what they'll do is there are there are a couple of groups that tell you whether or not the chocolate was ethically sourced. One is called Rainforest Alliance. Um, that's one that if so if it has a Rainforest Alliance, which has got a little uh, frog on the sticker, you know that it's been ethically sourced. The other is Utz Good Inside, which is an ethically sourced uh, form of chocolate. So they'll certify that it's it's um, it's ethically sourced. So there's still a lot of a lot of uh, chocolate that's not ethically sourced, but you can look for those symbols on your chocolate, and that will tell you something. You can go to the source. I actually tried this. There was a recommendation that CNN put out. They said go to the source, ask your local chocolatier where the chocolate came from. So I tried this. There was a local chocolate place in my neighborhood in Oklahoma City when I was living down there, down the street on Western. And so I went in and I asked them, "Where's your chocolate come from? There, Texas?" No, no, your chocolate. Didn't. No, we yeah, came from Texas. No, they don't. They don't grow cocoa plants in Texas. Um, probably not. They grow them in South America. They grow them on the west coast of Africa. No, it came from Texas. So that doesn't always work. But uh, a lot of times you can find local chocolatiers that, that do have an idea of where their product is sourced, and that that's a good way of educating yourself on whether or not the chocolate is, is ethically is ethically sourced. And so a lot of us would say you, you can't do that. Even though it exists, you shouldn't do that. We should put an end to it and we should try to. Now the third one is the most difficult to deal with and it's called psychological egoism. And this one says that you think you have free will, but in fact you don't have. 
free will. Free will is illusory. As a result of nature or nurture or a combination of the two, you can't help but react to the things that you react to. And there's a guy named Martin Lindstrom in a book called Biology who argues this. In the science of why we buy what we buy, Lindstrom says in biology that we can predict with laser-like precision whether or not a product will sell. So, and I actually had some of my colleagues that were doing this at New Mexico State. We had a project with the Department of Psychology where they had gone out, the College of Business and the Department of Psychology went out and they bought an fMRI machine and they were using these brain uh, <coughs> monitoring devices to determine whether or not people reacted to certain stimuli in a positive way. And it turns out that we can look at the pretty predictable brain patterns of things like the pleasure principle that people experience. And so one of the examples of this is Lindstrom talks in biology about doing these brainwave scans on smokers. And when you see these horrible advertisements for smoking that show you what smoking does, how many of you have seen the advertisement and it shows a camel and it says, the tobacco companies tell you that smoking is cool, that the beautiful people do it, that everybody is doing it, you should try it. But how would you feel if you knew that you would end up, and it shows this guy who's kind of grayed out, he's bald, he's missing a limb, he's in a wheelchair, that you will look like this. It turns out when you show those ads to smokers, the part of the brain that you would think that would be triggered would be the fear part of the brain, and the part of the brain that's actually triggered is not the fear part of the brain, it's the pleasure part of the brain. You show them these ads like that one with the camel changing and then ending up with this guy in a hospital on an oxygen uh, mask. He's kind of grayed out, looks disgusting, and they're chosen to go out and take a cigarette to smoke. And so Lindstrom says we can really predict what people are going to like. How many of you think you have free will that you can tell yourself that you don't want something? Can you will yourself to not want something? What is it that you all really love? It's really different. I mean, for your generation, my generation, although less so than my parents' generation, we really we're about more stuff than your generation is. One of the things that we know about your generation is that you're not all that concerned with stuff. You're actually not all that concerned. I think one of the things that's nice about your generation is you're not as concerned about materialistic goods as my generation was. You're not as concerned with brand names as my generation was. What you are addicted to, the studies show, is experiences. You are experienced, and I see you shaking your heads, yes. You are experienced junkies. It's one of the reasons that I have to vary my lecture, I change my inflection, I walk up and down, I have crazy arm gestures. I watch myself on, on the videos, and I'm like, oh, your arms are just all over, you're all over the place. It's because I know from the research that in order to keep your attention, I have to do different things about every 30 seconds. You have the attention span of Dory. Or a nap on crack. So I do these different things. I start, you know, throwing them. Around. Can't catch. <laughs> so you're addicted to experiences. Can you tell yourself, can you will yourself to not want that? Think about this. Can you will yourself to not want it? What kinds of experiences do you all like? How many of you have gone to do the I Fly thing out on Memorial Road? It's the indoor skydiving deal. None of you have done this? 
broke. You're broke college students. You don't like having your feet off the ground. How many of you want to try it? Can you will yourself to not want to try it? That's not the same thing. <laughs> you still want it. You still want it. You just can't afford it. And you can probably afford it. It's just that you want something else more, which is what? You want to eat. <laughs> but you didn't will yourself to want that either. Did you? For a psychological egoist, this is what we call a deterministic philosophy. It is predetermined. You think you know what you want and that you can will yourself, but you can't will yourself to want something that you want. You may want something else more, but you didn't will yourself to want that either. I may want a pair of shoes, but I may want my cash and my bank account more than I want the pair of shoes. Doesn't mean that I don't still want it. It just means that I want something else more. But I didn't force myself to want that something else more, did I? Can you force yourself? Can you sit there and say, I just don't want that chocolate cake. I just don't want it. You can force yourself to want something? Really? What's the most disgusting food that you just can't stand? What's the most disgusting, like you, just, like you just think, oh my god, every culture has disgusting foods, right? Maybe you really should, what? A snail. A snail. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a delicacy, it's called escargot. It's not the little snails that you see out here wandering around like that. That's the, you know, don't go out there and grab a snail line and pop it in your mouth and think you're doing something wonderful and French-like. Uh, yeah. Escargot is it's a, it's an aquatic snail, and oh god, I I, I just can't. I, I, my mother likes it. I ugh, uh, I just oh, it's it slimy. Like, what? It tastes like chicken. It does not taste like chicken. <laughs> you know, I, I've had all of these things that people tell me taste like chicken, and they don't like. They're like alligator tastes like chicken. No, it doesn't. You know what tastes like chicken? Chicken. Not even turkey, which is the closest thing to chicken, tastes like chicken. It doesn't. It, it tastes like turkey, right? It's, it's different. Alligator does not taste. I've I've gone to the rattlesnake hunt that they have out in western Oklahoma. They cook rattlesnake. And they'll say it tastes like chicken. <clears throat> no, it's it's got a grainier texture to it. It's not chicken. It's what? It's gamey. It's gamey. Yeah. It's a it's a, no. It doesn't taste like chicken. So yeah. Could, have you tried this car gown? Would you try it? You might. I, I just feel like it's easier say that marketers are no longer just satisfying needs and wants. We are creating irrational needs and wants of people that they can't overcome. We are creating in them, and that, that may be really unethical. If it's true, that it's unethical. Now, what can we say about psychological egoism? Well, first of all, it makes a categorical statement. We always behave in a certain way. What psychological egos will say is we ultimately always behave in selfish ways. We're always selfish. Now, you might say that's just clearly not the case because we've got examples like Mother Teresa. But a psychological egoist would say, yes, she's still acting selfishly. She is addicted to or likes the good feelings that she gets from when she's dead, by the way, now. So she's not getting any feelings at this point. But, you know, I mean, 
she, she's addicted to the good feelings that she got from helping the poor. Or maybe it was God that told her to, and she wouldn't want to disobey an order from God because she is a an incredibly devout person. But she didn't want that or will herself to want that either. So we're always behaving selfishly. We're always doing what we want. Well, there's a problem with this argument. And it's, first of all, the first problem with it is that it rests on what we call the fallacy of equivocation. It equivocates on feelings from motivation. So it says we always do what we want. And that's clearly not true. I may feel good because I do something for somebody else, but that's not necessarily my motivation for doing it. It's the feelings that, that it. so anytime you say people always do X, it's, it's really suspect. Second problem with psychological egoism is that it doesn't tell us how people behave when they're conflicted. We're oftentimes enormously conflicted in the choices that we have to make. How many of you have been faced with a dichotomy in which you had no good choice and you were enormously conflicted? Or maybe the opposite of that. You were faced with two really good choices. You had friend A who invited you to go to the movies and you had friend B that invited you to go to the pub. And you want to see the movie, but you also like to drink beer. And you can't do both. What should you do? Do both. You, you can't be in two places at once, can you? You go, you pregame. You tailgate. It makes it, it equivocates on his motives and feelings. And it tells us we always do this. And anytime you start saying things like human beings always do this, it's enormously suspect because pe people are enormously complex. And many times we may not even understand why we're doing the things we're doing. With regard to this idea that Lindstrom has in biology that we can look at the brain and we can see, it tells us what part of the brain is active. It doesn't tell us what people are actually thinking. And people do quit, even as much as they want you know, the cigarette, or the part of the brain that's firing is the part that's pleasure. Maybe, you know, they're thinking about that, but they're denying it. And so it doesn't tell us how we deal with these conflicts. So it's categorical. It tells us we always do these things. Now, what's wrong with these three as a whole? And then I will end for the day. The problem with these three challenges is that the two are intuitively appealing. The third is not. But all of them have some flaws that make them fundamentally not valid ethical theories. First of all, they are not based on rational analysis. They are based on emotion. So the first clue that you have that, that you have a valid ethical theory is that it is based on reason and not emotion. These are all based on emotion, subjectivism. I feel this way. Cultural relativism. Our group believes. Psychological egoism. I can't help myself. They're based on emotion. As such, they are not universalizable. You can't apply them universally to all people at all places at all times. So you have to have a rule that's based on reason, that's universally applicable, and that you can act on, that is feasible. These are not feasible. If we allowed subjectivism to stand, we would have no society. If we allowed cultural relativism to stand, we could never say that Hitler's Germany was wrong, that we should never repeat that. If we allowed the psychological egoist, we would say, well, we can't hold moral people morally culpable for anything because they have no impulse control, which is clearly not the case. So the foundations of a valid ethical theory are that it's going to be based on reason, it's going to be universally applicable, and that you can actually accomplish it. And with that, I am out of time. I will see you on Thursday. We're a little bit behind, but I am like Sherman marching to Atlanta. I can get us caught up.